Okay, so today we'll talk about paratransgenesis, the first lecture on this. Uh, paratransgenesis, what is that? It's modifying an organism to modify the organism that that organism lives inside of. Yes. So you modify a symbiont or something else that's living inside of something else to modify that something else instead of modifying that something else directly. Did you catch that? So in some ways this has some advantages. It can be easier. So you're saying it's modifying a symbiont to have an effect on the host that that symbiont lives in? That's precisely what I mean. I don't understand why you didn't get it in the first place. It can be easier to spread. Maybe, sometimes. It depends on the context, it depends what you want to do. In some cases, it can be more efficient in terms of like proximity. Like what are you trying to, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to do something in the gut? Maybe it's best to do it in, in the, the gut. gut. So, so yeah, so it has, it can in some cases have some um, advantages. And in some cases there are some disadvantages to it. But you got to know kind of like what it is because you'll see the concept a lot in, as you move forward. And there's always two things that need to happen in a paratransensis strategy. One is you need to be able to modify the symbiont, okay? But that's just step one. That, and that's, that's the main point I wanna convey is that this is only half of the equation. The other half is you need to be able to spread that modification. So we talked before about kind of like gene drive of Wolbachia when Wolbachia kind of like was used to replace um, a population. That was kind of this second, second part of this. And it's always hard to find a strategy where these two things can be coupled together. So Wolbachia's problem is you can't modify it, but you can use it to spread. Um, and in many other cases, you, we can easily modify some bacteria, but it's very difficult for it to spread. So it's very difficult to find something where these two things, part one and part two, are linked together. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this paper. So does somebody wanna just give me the basic concept of what they did in this paper? How could I do that? I obviously didn't read the paper. Rodnius Rotokakai is the simian. Rodin, I don't know how to spell it, Rodnius. Yeah, so, okay, so the basic gist here, the problem why they're researching this is there's this disease called Chagas disease. Okay, Chagas disease, the pathogen is a trypanosome, which is a single-celled protist-like organism. Uh, it's called, its name is Trypanosoma cruzi. It's closely related to Trypanosoma, <coughs> Trypanosoma brucei, gambiense. Oh wait, there's a different, there's a different species that causes African sleeping sickness. Oh, I shouldn't write that. <laughs> Not ass, African sleeping sickness. Um, but in South America, there's a different species, Trypanosoma cruzi, uh, which floats around in kissing bugs. Okay, so kissing bugs are these hemipterans, they're bugs, hemipterans. When you hear, when you hear bug in insect, that actually means something, that means hemiptera. Bugs are typically uh, insects that look like this. They have a long, sharp proboscis that comes back like this. And oftentimes you find them and they stick their proboscis into plants and they suck out plant juice and things like that. But there are some called kissing bugs or bed bugs are kind of similar. And these eat what? Skin? Imagine, bed bugs don't eat skin. Imagine, imagine this scenario in a plant. What are, what is the, what is this insect eating? The right, yeah. So these ones, these ones are the same concept, but in humans, where they'll stick their proboscis into your veins or your arteries, and they'll suck out blood. So bed bugs eat blood. 
But we're not talking about bed bugs today. We're talking about kissing bugs, which also eat blood. So they're called kissing bugs because when you go to sleep at night uh, and you lay in your bed, they'll crawl up on your face and bite your face. That's why they're kissing bugs. Uh, and they eat your blood. And their big problem in, we have them here in Alabama, we have them in the South, uh, and they're a big problem in South America. And they're a huge problem where people live in houses with like thatch roofs. So like if you live in the rainforest in South America and you got this thatch roof, the kissing bugs will live in your roof and then they'll come feed on you when you go to sleep at night. So that's kind of the gist with kissing bugs. Draw. And the problem is, normally that would not be a problem if they were just feeding on you. See, we don't, bed bugs are actually not really that big of a problem. I mean, I, I should be careful how I say that. They're kind of a convenience problem. They don't kill you. They won't kill you. Um, but the kissing bugs can give you a disease, which is called Chagas disease. Okay. And they do that by taking up a blood meal from an infected person. So if this is the kissing bug, they take it in blood meal that's infected with trypanosomes, okay? And then they go to the next person and they take a second blood meal and while they're taking a blood meal, they poop out the trypanosomes into your, basically onto your skin and then you kind of scratch it and you get infected with Chagas disease. So that's the, that's the gist of the disease. The kissing bugs are the vector. That means they're something that spreads the disease. And in vector biology, there's, there's a concept where, well, I don't know if I want to say it, but, but there's, a, there's a chain of events, chain of events that has to happen for the disease to get spread. Okay, and one of the chains is that, one, it has to get picked up into the gut from the first blood meal, Second, the kissing bug needs to take a second blood meal and it needs to crap it out. And during that time, right, like it's sitting in the, it's sitting in the gut. It's sitting in the insect's internal system, okay? And so in vector biology and in biotechnology, even in plant biotechnology, this is, this is similar because plants can be vectored viruses. We're always trying to find a way to like break the weakest link in the chain, right? Like if we can find a strategy that can prevent transmission of these particular diseases, we might be able to break, uh, stop that cycle from happening. So one way is this kissing bug in its gut, it's got bacteria. It's got these symbionts called Rhodococcus, wait, Rodney, that's their name, and they always just live in the gut. Did you catch how they're transmitted from generation to generation? Probably some strange form of coprophagy. Are they? Did it say that? I thought they were crapped out. Yeah. And then, the, so what happens is, well, that's that's different than like, I guess, laying it on the egg. They, like they lay an egg and they poop on the egg. Okay, there you go. Yeah, and then the things that come out eat it. And it gets picked up. And so it's cycled. So this is technically, this is what's called, um, you could call this maternal transmission, but it's a different strategy of maternal transmission. It's not passed on like Wolbachia is like living inside the eggs. It's kind of passed on by a behavioral mechanism, if that makes sense. The behavior of the bug is adapted in a way that transmits the symbiont. And the symbiont is essential. Did you catch why it's essential for the bug? What happens to the bug if you get rid of the symbiont? Yeah, it doesn't, it can't molt. So it does die eventually. But the real reason, the mechanism, is it prevents molting. Okay, so what's molting? Just real quick, if you haven't had bug stuff. Yeah, so bugs are living inside of an exoskeleton, which cannot change its size. It's just like a snake. Well, I guess it's not exactly like a snake. But when the bug wants to grow to the next stage, it, it has no room to grow. So it has to shed its 
exoskeleton. So that's called a molt. Okay, and um, this symbiont is essential for molting. So if you get rid of the symbiont, the bugs can't molt and they die. So in that sense, they are essential. Okay, so that's the setup of the system, is there's a bug, it carries pathogens in its gut, it also has a symbiont in its gut. The question is, can we engineer this symbiont to block transmission of the trypanosome? And how do they want to do that? They want to express a gene in the symbiont to kill the trypanosomes in the gut. What's the gene? Sacropin A. What's it going to do? It's a toxin. So it should kill trypanosomes, right? How does it do that? Good. Forms pores. So sacropin is a type of... Do you guys know where it came from? What? So it's a type of protein that you find in insects. It's called an antimicrobial peptide. So the insect, just like a human, has an immune system. Okay, And if an insect gets infected with a bacteria or a parasite or a microbe, it wants to have ways of killing that microbe, just like any human. And as part of its immune system, it has these genes that are called AMPs, not ampicillin, totally different, not an antibiotic. It is kind of an antibiotic, but it's not ampicillin. Um, it stands for antimicrobial peptide. And what these things do is it's a gene that codes for a protein, and the protein has helices, okay? And helical proteins often will get inside membranes of microbial organisms. And then as soon as it gets in the membrane, as soon as the helices get in the membrane, it opens up a hole in the microbe and basically it just pops the cell. They just spill out. It's like poking a pin in a balloon. That's what the sacropins do. So this is actually an insect gene whose goal is to kill microbes. And they want to stick it in rodneus, rotococci, so that it could kill the trypanosomes. Do you see and do you have any questions about this strategy? Like there's something here that actually doesn't quite make sense. And I want to see if you guys catch it. Yeah. Well, they don't target pumps. They just get in the membrane. Like they just pop in the membrane. But what you're saying is exactly right. It's exactly what I'm looking for is the both of these are microbes, like the Rhodococcus rodneyi. Zoom in here. That's a microbe, that's a bacteria. The trypanosomes are not bacteria, okay? Um they're they're actually they're considered eukaryotes. They're eukaryotes, but they're single celled. It's kind of like, I guess in a way, kind of like yeast, but they're not fungi, I don't think. But it's a microbe, and it has a membrane. So yeah, like the question is, why is the rotococcus, the symbiont, able to make the sarcopin without killing itself? That's actually like a question that I have that I don't have the answer to yet. What do you think could be the reason? I got a couple of like rationales. I did okay, so it said it can't it can't withstand infinite infinity amounts, but it can withstand like a low load. Is that what you're saying? Okay, why can it why can it withstand this low load, but the trypanosome can't withstand like any load? I think I don't know if this is true, but here are some hypotheses. One, the cercropin is actually a gene from an insect. I can't remember exactly which specific sarcopin they use. I don't know if they use the Rodneus sarcopin. Does anybody know that? From, did they don't say where it's from? 
Okay. So they don't tell you what insect it's from, what, what one they clone it from. But my point is that Rodneyus probably has this gene already in it. And so the symbiont has probably learned to survive when it's around. So there's probably an evolutionary relationship, evolutionary, where the symbiont has like learned how to survive in kind of the constant pressure of Cercropin. So that's one hypothesis for maybe why you could engineer the symbiont to make Cercropin and it wouldn't kill itself. Second one, what do we know about bacteria? What, how are their how are their membranes organized? Yeah, there's negative and positive. And Rhodococcus rhodii is a gram negative, I think. Is that correct? Somebody fact check that. Google that. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's gram negative. Gram negative means what? Either no or limited cell wall. But in this case, it has. I think it has a little bit of a cell wall. And then it has two membranes. So you could imagine a scenario where the trypanosome, that's a eukaryotic cell. It's got no, I don't think it has a cell wall. Somebody else should Google that too. Does trypanosome have a cell wall? It doesn't. There could, basically my hypothesis is, the point is, is these membranes are not exactly the same, okay? And the structure of the membrane of the trypanosome might be just a little bit more sensitive, sensitive to the sercropin gene uh, as opposed to the membrane of the symbiont. And that could again go back to the evolutionary relationship where maybe the symbiont has actually even maybe altered its membrane structure a little bit so that it's not as likely to be killed by the, the sercropin gene. So that's kind of just one thing to, uh, I guess, to talk about. And I don't, I don't know the answers. I don't have all the answers to that. That's one thing that I always think when I, when I reread this paper. Um, and the reason we're reading this paper is because this is the first paratransgenesis paper ever written. So this is the first paper where they actually test this hypothesis. That's why I make you guys read this. Um, okay, so let's look at, let's look at some of this stuff. What was this? What? Yeah, the plasma they built. Um, what kind of a plasmid is it? Where'd they buy it from? They they made it. Where'd they take it from? Was it the, the bacterium as well? Which one? Which bacterium? Uh, yeah. So so they uh this is remember I told you this is uh what's the name for this? A shuttle plasmid or a shuttle vector. So this means they wanted to overexpress something in the Rodneyus. They needed a way to give it a gene. So they found its own endogenous plasmid. And they took that plasmid and they converted it into a tool that they could use for biotechnology. So that's a shuttle plasmid. So what did they have to do to it? To, to be able, just imagine, walk through the scenario of what you have to do to engineer this thing. Okay, you gotta grow the bacteria and then and then what? Right? What do you have to do even before you can insert a gene? Find the bacteria and extract. Okay, so you extract a plasmid. Okay, so they so let's say they grow the symbiont. They can just grow it in the kissing bugs. And then let's say they mini prep a plasmid. I don't know if they actually did mini prep, but you get the point. Let's say they purify the plasmid from uh Rhodococcus rodnii. Then what happens? Then what do they do? I got the plasmid in a tube. Now you gotta add in um like your uh your bacteria and your bacteria that are antibiotic cassette. For okay, so so which one which antibiotic cassette are they gonna add in? Okay, they add in AMP. So let's see, let me find that. Where is that? Here's the AMP. Okay, so they added in this. And then what? So let's say they did the PCR of the AMP cassette, they ligated it in, then what? Um, did they add in the um, nutrition enzyme sites or is that native? 
most of this is restriction enzyme cloning. So let's say they would have cloned this one with, um, I don't know, I'm assuming this one and something up here, maybe this. But my, they add in the AMP, but then what has to happen? Like they add an AMP, what's the next step? So they have a plasma now with ampicillin in it. It's basically the symbionts plasma with ampicillin. Then what do they do with it? What, what, what are you going to grow what on selective media? Okay, so they have to put it into E. coli. So they put it into E. coli. Is it going to replicate in E. coli? Wait, a promoter? What? Why would it not replicate in E. coli? You guys still haven't hit it yet. There's a reason it won't, you haven't told me yet how they make it so that it will replicate in E. coli. No, not, it's no, not promoter. What makes, what makes plasmids replicate? Origin. origin, they need to add the E. coli origin. Or in this case, I actually don't know if they took, they either added in the origin from rotocar. Yeah, so that must be what they did. So what they did is they took a plasma that works in E. coli already. It already had the E. coli origin, which is right here. And then they cloned in. So it would have already had, it would have already had the ampicillin cassette because it was an E. coli plasma. But then they added in the rotococcus rodenii origin with these restriction sites. Okay. So they had to add, my point was they needed to add in an origin, either for the E. coli or the rotococcus rodenii, because it's not a plasma that's compatible with both. They had to create a plasma that was compatible with both. So they took an E. coli one, they added in the rotococcus rodenii origin, and then they have a selective cassette for uh, ampicillin in E. coli, but what did they select with in the, in the symbiont? This thio, I think it's like thiostreptin or something like that. It's a different, different selective cassette. So they add in this, and, oh, I circled the wrong thing. They add in this. This is the selection cassette in the Rotococcus rodenii. So this is like a yeast, kind of like a yeast plasmid, where a yeast plasmid has selection for the E. coli and selection for the yeast. This plasmid has selection for E. coli and origin for E. coli. And it's got selection in the Rotococcus rodenii symbiont and origin for the Rotococcus rodenii symbiont. Okay, so it's like a dual compatible uh, plasma. That's they. That's the first thing they need to do. They need to make it dual compatible. And then they add in the sacropin gene, which is right here. And what was the promoter they used? Why? Why would they do that? Is that the re is that the reason why would they why would they do it why would they use that promoter? Is it one that you can use a similar to the other one in like a cancer plant like you could use it for actual insects? No, because it's not expressed from the insect. It's expressed in the symbiont which lives in the insect. What's the reason that they chose that promoter? No, this is a constitutive promoter, I think. I think this style resistance gene is always on. I don't think it's a, it's not an on-off promoter. I think it's always on. So it's on regardless of the presence of... It's not, they're not turning it on or off, yeah. They're not controlling it, it's just on. Okay, so basically they use the same one then because they want something that's that's pretty close. So it's that, but a little bit more. Um, the better way to say it is, um, okay, they're studying a new symbiont. Had anybody ever made a plasma for the symbiont before? No. So had anybody ever characterized a promoter for the symbiont before? No. But there's one gene that they know is being made in the symbiont, which is the selective cassette that they can select for it with. So basically they knew it would work. They just knew it would work. They just knew it would be on. So they used it. But that's actually one of my biggest criticisms of this paper is 
that promoter is garbage. Like, there's no reason they should have chosen that promoter, aside from the fact that they were. this was the first time they were doing this and they had no other choice because they just thought this might work. So why is it a bad promoter? That's a good question. Let's, let's look at the data. Hang on. Let's look at... Look at this figure. What's this? Okay, it's a Western. What are they? What's the antibody? Yep, it's anti-sarcopin. So what's what is this telling you? How did they do this experiment? What's one, two, three, four, five, six? What's this? Oh, it doesn't express in most of them. Wait, 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 hang on, hang on. What's one, two, three, four, five, six? Different bugs. Bugs, yes. Okay, so this is like their bug number N. They only did six N, but okay, this is their bugs. So they have different bugs. And then they did a Western on those bugs that had that symbiont, which is expressing the sacropin. And just like you said, uh, would you say that the expression is pretty strong or pretty weak? Very what? Yeah, it's really weak. Like, this is terrible expression. Either their antibody sucks, or their expression sucks, or either way, it's just not really working. This is, this is, their antibody's not that great, because look, this is, this is synthetic, so this is actually, this is actually not a bug. Um, this is, this is them just adding the sacropin. Yeah, so like, this is like their positive control right here. And there's maybe like two bugs that you can see the expression of. Five and six. So we conclude that it's not really expressing well. Um, and that's one reason why I say that promoter is probably just garbage. It's not really expressing this thing really well. Yeah, well, look at, look at, I mean, you can phenotypically, you can't, from this, so this is, this is a key classical thing that you'll experience for the rest of your life in science, that can you make the conclusion in two, three, and four that the gene is not being expressed? Can you make that conclusion? No, because absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Does that make sense? Because there's nothing there. I can't conclude that it's not there. I can just conclude that I can't see it. It might be there at lower levels. So they actually do this experiment. Um, and this actually, these are the same, are these the same bugs? Oh shit. Um, what's the y axis here? Oh, the y axis. So they're using the hemocytometer and they're somehow like quantifying the number of um, trypanosomes in the bug. So the y axis here is number of trypanosomes in a bug. I don't know if this is like a log scale or, or times a certain thousand or something like that. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but it's number of trypanosome bugs. And then control is a wild type bug. Recombinant is a bug with the, with the symbiont. And for the most part, they show like you get this reduction. In every one, there's at least a little bit of a reduction. So they kind of show you that, well, consistently you do get like a phenotypic reduction in the number of trypanosomes. So the expression might not be super consistent or super great, but it seems like it's enough to make it work at least. But it's not super consistent. That's definitely um, one of the conclusions. What's, what's this data? This was their first experiment where they actually proved that the sacropin can kill um, microbes. So they just put, they, these are plated uh, trypanosomes? So here they have rodinous rhodococci symbiont transformed to express sacropin A gene. Examples from wild type is not engineered. And what they do is they plate the symbionts with, I think it's, yeah, with E. coli. So they put on these plates, they put two microbes. They put E. coli and they put the Rhodococcus rhodnii. Okay? And in each of these plates, well not in the not in this one, but in these two, in each of these plates, 
what they're showing you is that if you have the rotococcus rodenii with the plasmid sarcopin, it kills all the E. coli. If you do the same experiment, but the rotococcus rodenii does not have that plasmid, the E. coli grows. So you see these streaks and these kind of like dots, that's the E. coli growing. That's a good question, and that goes back to the original criticism that we were talking about. Like, they're using E. coli, which is also another gram-negative model. Does, does the E. coli uh, structure look anything like the trypanosome structure? I have no idea, and I would doubt it. I was going to say, it was a, it was a problem. Yeah, so I would doubt it. But they're, but they're just demonstrating here that the sacropin can kill, like, a, a generic microbe, okay? So that's kind of like this experiment, but I agree 100% with your, with your criticism. Um, okay, let me ask another question before I forget. So let's talk about that one and the two. So they, they can, I 100% believe they can engineer this plasmid and they can get it in the microbe. Um, so actually, I'm going to make a point three here two and three. Point two is how do they even get the symbiont into the bug? How do they do that? Well, wait, that's step three. That's the spread. Not even there yet. Like to do these experiments, how do they get the symbiont in the bug? That's in the spread, but that's not how they actually give it to the bug in the tests. It's feeding, yeah. What was the blood? Yeah, so they feed them rabbit's blood, and in the blood, they mix in their new symbiont. Okay, but let me ask you another question. So, <clears throat> to do this experiment, let's move over here. To feed the rabbit blood to the new symbiont, you got to have a colony of Rodneyus, right? So they got colonies of bugs. Now, in order for this colony of bugs to survive, do they already have the symbiont in there? Yes. Okay, so they already have bugs with the symbiont living in there. How do they get the new symbiont into that bug? Yeah, they gotta somehow make a, a like a negative symbiont bug, okay? And that is a key term I put on the on the terms, which is called aposymbiotic. That means apo is like without. There's no symbiont, so they have to make a bug without symbionts that can then feed on the infected rabbit blood. So they do that with antibiotics. But I have no idea how they did it because it, and they don't really like clearly like tell you because the symbiont, they say the symbiont's essential. So you couldn't rear multiple generations. Normally when you do, a, when you make aposymbiotic bugs, like if you take Drosophila fruit flies and you want to cure them of Wabakia, you usually grow them for multiple generations in tetracycline, which will kill off their Wabakia. But the Wabakia is not essential for Drosophila. So you can do that. I don't know how in the hell they did this with uh, bugs that are that are need their symbiont to molt. I think they probably just took like a they probably took like a, um, a nymph, which is like a baby bug, and then they fed it antibiotics, and they probably kind of like reduced the they probably like reduced the load of that symbiont but they probably didn't kill them all. And then when they fed them the blood, they kind of like 90% maybe replaced that population with their modified symbiont. I think, that's, I think that's basically what they did. And then they were able to do these experiments with bugs that had the symbiont that was modified GMO and then bugs that had the symbiont that was wild type. 
or they just use the selectable cassette on the plasmid that they built probably that but I didn't realize that at the time apparently it was also pretty unclear in the paper yeah that's kind of all they say they basically say like we transform the bacteria and then we introduce it into the aposymbiotic nymphs oh so that is right so they did use the nymphs um, but they don't tell you like they don't quite tell you like how they did the treatment how they cured it unless I missed that um, not in this paper that's what I was saying it, it yeah it could have been the they could have been referencing a different paper like and that's pretty common maybe they've worked out all this stuff before um, and then they and then they publish like a paper and then they just kind of like self-reference that paper what does first instar mean? so bugs when they molt um, when they come out of the egg, so if you have an egg, it develops, and then the first thing that comes out of that is either, there's two different types of life cycles for bugs. There's a holometabolus, and there's a hemimetabolus, and that means, holometabolus means metamorphosis, hemimetabolus means no metamorphosis, and in holometabolus insects, what comes out of the egg is like a worm, a larvae. This is like a caterpillar that you learned in like elementary school. The larvae comes out and then it forms a pupae. After that larvae, that larvae will usually like molt a couple times. And, and the first instar is the first larval form, okay? And then it molts into the second instar and then a third instar and however many instars there are. And then it forms a pupae and then it comes out as the beautiful butterfly which is the adult. That's metamorphosis. Kissing bugs do not do that. They're hemimetabolous. That means everything that comes out of the egg is basically like a tiny adult. That's like what nymph means. So what comes out is basically a mini rodneus, which is the nymph. And they can also call that the first instar. And then when this nymph molts into a bigger Rodneus, that's the second instar. And then it molts into a bigger Rodneus, that's the third instar, and then it molts into the adult, which is like the final form. So this is holometabolus, hemimetabolus. You don't have to memorize that because it's not a bug class, but just to answer your question, that's what that's what when they say first instar, that's what that means. It means this first nymph that comes out of the egg. And then in is the uh holo. Yeah. yeah. All flies, dipterans, so mosquitoes, uh, fruit flies, uh, those are all holometabolous. All butterflies are holometabolous. Moths are holometabolous. But bugs, quote unquote bugs, which are hemipterans, like bed bugs and kissing bugs, are uh, heavy metabolous. There's a split in it, this is this is I well this is fun because it's a fun tangent. But um, there's in bug evolution there was a split at one point where um, you have hemimetabolus, and everything before it was hemimetabolus, and then at some point bugs learned how to do holo, how to do holometaboly, and then everything after this split follows metamorphosis, and everything before the split is non-metamorphosis. And flies like dipterans, lepidopterans, as butterflies, moths, those all fall on this path of evolution. Uh, okay, so what were, I mean, we can talk, okay, well, just to, to finalize this, because this is kind of funny. So, okay, point three, how are they going to spread it? Now talk about what I know you guys know the answer is. Yeah, so so tell me what the cruci card was. Yeah, it's synthetic, it's synthetic, uh, that's why I love this paper, it's synthetic uh, insect shit. And they're like, well, we're going to take this insect poop. We're going to make some fake insect poop. We'll put some Rodneus rotococci in the poop, and then we'll spray the fake poop all over your house. Yeah. Isn't that a great idea? So it's like they spray the fake fake poop uh, in the house. And then here's where the paper ends. It's kind of anticlimactic. It ends with this last figure, which doesn't actually validate the strategy. It doesn't actually show you that it works. All it shows you is that the in, when they spray the cruci guard, the fake poop, the insects that eat it can like pick it up and they survive. 
So basically it's showing you that the, uh, the genetically modified symbiont can um, complement uh, the, it, it's just, it just works functionally as well for allowing the insect to mold. But they don't actually show any reduction in like disease transmission. Um, and there were never any papers after this on this strategy. So I think they got like a patent, but but it's, the cruise guard is not being used. Nobody does that. Um, but it's I like this paper. It's a funny paper because it's super creative. It's kind of fun. The in, the the uh, data is really really simple. Um, it's a good it's a good introduction to kind of paratransgenesis, and it's an important paper because it was the first paratransgenesis paper. Uh, I also want to talk about how. This kind of goes to the heuristics lecture. So it's kind of good that I had you guys do that before. Um, this is kind of like a complicated strategy um, to prevent Chagas disease. And it, it probably doesn't even work. Like they spent all this time doing all this stuff. It probably doesn't even work. Can you think of any like simpler strategies that could prevent Chagas disease? Yeah, like a bug net, like put a net around your bed and then no Chagas disease. Or better yet, like instead of living in like a thatch roof, like build a normal house. So, and, and I understand like most of these, these diseases affect like third world countries where they just don't have money to build a house. But um, like the reason, like we have, uh, we, don't, we have um, kissing bugs but we don't have like rampant Chagas disease. And that's mostly because like, like the houses that people live in here are like the Rodneys can't just like reproduce in your roof and then like come into your house. I, I mean, for the most part, I mean, of course some people do uh, live and stuff like that, but like, so there's kind of a question, like we could do all this complicated genetic stuff, all this complicated biotechnology, or we could kind of just like build better houses or sleep under a bug net which is like probably actually going to work, whereas this thing is probably not going to work. Um, and especially with like, like you can 3D print houses now. You can like 3D print concrete houses. So I, I just don't think that the genetic stuff here is actually going to be the fix of Chagas disease. And it's probably going to be more like a public health type thing. Um, okay, so that was my thing. What else did you guys, did you guys have any other criticisms that you wanted to share or comments from your quizzes? I gave you all 10 out of 10. One amount was the one we already talked about. Oh, that's good. That means that means we were thinking alike. That I had, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I had that same question was um yeah, that, that was the point three. I actually forgot to talk about that. Point three, the spread. How are you ever going to be able to, even, even if it worked, how are you going to be able to spray the poop into the houses and then have that symbiont population replace the symbionts that are already there in the insect gut? Like, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know. They didn't even look at it. Either. Yeah, they didn't even measure it, really. So that is a great criticism. And that's completely unanswered, and I suspect that's probably why this thing left uh, left it there. The next paper we read, so we read next we'll read mosquito paratransgenesis on on steroids. So this is like uh, this is like this paper times ten. This next paper that we'll read, and they have they in theory have a way to replace um, the population. So that will be the next paper.